Then already preached. Hey Amen. If you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter one. Start at verse one. God bless you too. All right, Hebrews chapter one, starting at verse one. If you were here for the the youth conference, um, if you remember, I did a message in Hebrews chapter thirteen, um, verses nine, all the way down, and that was kind of the the end. That's the response and how we walk in light of what verses one through four of chapter one are talking about. So we, we kind of started at the end with our response to the gospel, and now we're at the heart of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, um, by being in chapter one at verse one. All right. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We pray that you honor your word as it goes forth and that your spirit ministers to our hearts and transforms us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the book of Hebrews is like no other book in the sense that in just 13 chapters, the entire book of Hebrews manages to go through all of redemptive history. It covers all of the Old Testament, uh, the Mosaic Law, the, the covenants that God made, creators, Moses, Abraham, David, he, he explains the reasoning behind why God did what he did um, with the people and nation of Israel and how everything that he promised in the Old Testament finds its yes in Jesus Christ. And the author of Hebrews outlines all of these points in the first four verses of the book and then spends the rest of the book explaining uh, what he means when he says this. Uh, so I have the, the main points right here and we'll go through verses one through four and just kind of pick it apart and explain it and come to a better understanding of redemptive history as a whole in God's work and the person and work of Jesus Christ. So we have Jesus is the complete and final revelation of God. Jesus is the all-powerful Son of God, and Jesus made purification for sins. So we'll start at verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So we see the predictions. We see the, the, the contrast between long ago and in these last days. We see the contrast between our fathers versus us, and in many ways, and in one way. Uh, so really quick, I'll go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy Chapter 5, starting at verse 24. 
Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting at verse 24. We got a lot of scripture this morning. And you said, behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man and man still live. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of fire as we have and has still lived? Go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say and speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you and we will hear and do it. Uh, when the people of Israel see the, the presence of God may manifest in the cloud and the fire and they hear his voice come out of the cloud and the fire, their response is horror. These people are terrified because they understand that you cannot be in the presence of a holy, righteous God and be a sinner. So they ask Moses, hey, Go on behalf of us, hear the word of God, come to us, whatever we will do. But we cannot be in the presence of God in our current state, lest his righteous judgment jump out and we, and we die. And so I, I used to ask myself, why did God use all of these prophets and these mediators? Why not just start off with Jesus and just bada boom, bada bing? Everything is reconciled to God, sure and sweet. But what we have to understand is we cannot be God's people and still have the stain of sin on us. The presence of God is fatal to the sinner. That's why the, the holy priest had to make sacrifices for himself first before he could go on the, the holy of holies and make atonement for the people. Because if he walks in to God's presence without first sacrificing for his own sins, he's dead on the spot. So we see that throughout uh, history and throughout uh, all of the time period and dispensations before Jesus Christ, that God uses mediators in grace and mercy to save his people from utter destruction. So the author of Hebrews says, in many ways and through many people, God spoke to us. But this time, in these last days, God spoke to us once for all through his son. Uh, let's go to Numbers chapter 11. Starting at verse 24 as well. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now here we see, we, we skip through a lot, but... In summary, Moses is leading the, the, the new nation of Israel after their exodus from Egypt, and they're complaining the whole way through the wilderness. They're like, God, we, in Egypt, we had meat, we had wine, we had all these things, and now we're just eating manna in the wilderness. Why did you lead us out here just for us to die in the wilderness full of nothing but bread? And Moses goes to God like, God, why did you give me these people that I did? They come from me and from my loins. Did I give birth to these people? 
why am I leading these people? And these are your, your children. He said, this burden is too heavy for me to carry. I cannot do this on my own. So God goes, all right, get 70 elders who you know to be men of God, who obey my commandments, and I'll take some of the spirit that's on you and give it to them, and they can help you in leading and judging the people. So Moses, as we just read, gets the people. God comes down, and he takes the and distributes distributes it um, to the the seventy elders. And here we see again th this this concept being reinforced that God cannot show himself to the multitude because they're still stained by sin, and that goes along with his distrib distribution of his spirit as well. Moses, at this point, is the only one who can mediate between God and the people. And God distributes his spirit, and now there's 71 mediators, people who can lead the nation of Israel. 71. That's it. And we see throughout the New Testament or the Old Testament, the prophets prophesying like there will come a time where all of God's people have the spirit of God. Everyone can worship freely wherever they are, not have to go across the nations to Jerusalem to make atonement for their sins, leave, have to come back, do it all over again. There will come a time where God himself will give a once and for all offering of sin where his presence will be accessible to all and where he'll distribute his spirit to all. And the author of Hebrews is saying that this promise was fulfilled in Jesus. There's no more mediators between God and man other than Jesus Christ. There's no mortal man who you have to go to, to sacrifice on your behalf, to go before the Lord on your behalf. God spoke to us once and for all through Jesus Christ. And he's the full revelation of Christ. Um, we'll go to John chapter one, where this this uh, passage just drives the point home. John chapter one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. But without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, became to bear witness about the light. The true light gives light to everyone and was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, became children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, as many might know that the word, um, that's translated as the word of God is the word logos. Now, people often just look only at the literal translation. Uh, so John used the word logos. Okay, we get it. Jesus is the word of God. But we have to ask ourselves when we interpret any of the scripture is that what would this mean to the initial recipients of the scriptures or the initial readers of the scrolls? And so... At, at the time John is reading this, the word logos means two to two of his 
different audiences. One, he has the Greek speakers or the, the Gentiles. And then on the other hand, he has the Jews. Now to the Greek thinkers and philosophers, the word logos, when they heard the word logos, it, it represented a concept of what they, what they thought was the creative, impersonal, unalive force uh, that created the, the universe and is responsible for the order of the created universe. It was an impersonal force, but that force explained why everything that is, is. But John tells the Gentiles that this creative force that is responsible for the order of everything that we see is not impersonal, but that force is God. And God was with God and God was God. And that the word became flesh, the logos, the creative force, the force that orders the universe came in flesh and was Jesus Christ. Now to, to the Jewish audience, the word logos, the word would mean something completely different. The word for the Jews, the, the chosen people of God, would be the scriptures. And so the scriptures was how God revealed himself to his chosen covenant people. It was the scriptures was the, the self-revelation of God. And so when the Jews read verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word was the very self-revelation. All of the attributes, all of God's self-revelation that he has shown us through his word has become flesh and is now the perfect revelation of God. The very essence of God has now become flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us. And now everything that God is, was, and will ever be has been shown to us through Jesus Christ. And the author of Hebrews masterfully conveys this concept in just two verses of his first chapter. Now let's turn back to Hebrews. The second point, Jesus is the all-powerful son of God. And we'll read the, the A part of verse 3 and then go down to verse 4. Verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And then go down to verse four, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Jesus is the all powerful son of God. And through whom all of creation was made for him, by him and through him. And our scripture that highlights this point will be found in Matthew chapter 17 where we see the transfiguration of Christ with Peter, James, and John. Yeah, the pages in my Bible are so thin, you flip one page and you end up in the other half of the book. I'm like, geez. <laughs> Matthew chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now in this scene, recorded by Matthew, we see Jesus revealed to these three disciples his full glory, all of his deity that exists in his body. Jesus shows them a glimpse of what they'll finally see in his second coming, of the fullness of the radiance of God himself. Jesus shows them the light of his glory, the splendor of his majesty in this moment. And in the different accounts in the different gospel, um, they highlight that Peter didn't even recognize what he was saying when he was like, I'll get a tent for you, for Moses and Elijah. He was just speaking just out of utter shock and awe of the fullness of God being shown to him through Christ. Psalms chapter two, verse seven uh, says, I will tell of my decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nation, nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. As the Son of God, Jesus has all rights to inherit all of creation. And we know that he'll exercise that right. And as the Son of God, Jesus has the right to judge all of creation. And we know that he'll exercise that right as well. So point one, Jesus is the complete and final revelation of God. The Bible is complete. The Bible gives the full account of the person and work of Christ, who is the final and definite revelation of God. You can't add to Scripture, and you can't take away from Scripture. The Bible is finished. The full account of how God will reconcile creation to him has already been written. So much so that we know what the second coming of Christ will look like. Um, if you ever read Revelation, sometimes you just go, I'm going to be gone before this happens. Because, yeah, y'all better repent. I'm going to pray for y'all in heaven, but I'm going to be gone when this happens. And point three, Jesus made purification for sins. Going back to Hebrews, our main passage. Start up. Verse three. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Here we see, for the first time ever, a priest making a sacrifice for sin and, and sitting down and resting after that sacrifice was made. Because every time anyone in the nation of Israel sinned, they had to make a sacrifice for that sin. And you have millions of sinners. And your job as the priest is to make a sacrifice for every one of those sinners every day that they sin for every sin. So the priest on any given day would just make sacrifices. The, the, the Israelite bring him the sacrifice, he sacrifices it. The next one brings him the sacrifice, he sacrifices it. The next one brings him the sacrifice, he sacrifices it. The next one brings him the sacrifice, he sacrifices it. And on and on and on, day in and day out. But 
of Jesus offered by God and slain by God was the lamb that would take away sins for good. And in heaven, when Jesus put his own blood in the, on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of all who will believe in him, after that, he sits down and rests, knowing that no other sacrifice will be needed and that no other sacrifice for sin would supersede his blood on that mercy seat. Jesus offered his blood for sins and rested, knowing that his work was finished. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All, like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I just look at the pronouns. He born our griefs. He was smitten by God. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. In other words, he was a substitute on our behalf. He got the punishment on the cross that we deserve for our sins. The wages of sin is death. And we all deserve death. But Jesus Christ took our place on the cross and shed his blood on our behalf and wiped away all of our sins. Now, if we go to Deuteronomy 28, and we'll close off with this. But just to give you the, the full scope of what Jesus did on the cross. Well, well strap ourselves in Deuteronomy 28 starting at verse 1 and if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God so listen to the condition if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God, now we get the result of our obedience, will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your, your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your baskets and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord your God will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself. As he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk and his ways. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your livestock, 
and in the fruit of the ground within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall only go up and not down. If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Quick question. Who has perfectly obeyed the law? Before you get excited about all the blessings, all the prosperity that has just been outlined in the first half of Deuteronomy 28, who has perfectly obeyed the law and qualifies and has legal rights to these promises? Now I'm about to read what everyone in here has rights to legally. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all of his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Curse shall you be in the city and curse shall you be in the field. Curse shall be your baskets and your kneading bowl. Curse shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion and frustration in all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence stick to you until he has consumed you off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. This is what we have legal rights to. Every curse outlined in the second half of Deuteronomy. And the beauty of the cross is that Jesus, who had legal rights to every blessing, who lived a perfect and righteous life, and who obeyed the laws of God perfectly, on the cross, he that knew no sin became sin for us. And he who had legal rights to every blessing of God for obedience to the law became a curse on the tree. And he faced God's wrath on our behalf. And that when we put faith in that sacrifice, the blood of Jesus atones for our sins permanently. And God transmutes Jesus' righteousness for those 33 years onto us. First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, uh, Paul says that all of God's promises find their yes in Jesus, and through him we give our amen. All of these blessings are in Christ and Christ alone. And by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We can have our sins washed away and his righteousness transmuted to us. And we can walk in the blessings of Christ on earth and in heaven. Let's just read our passage in Hebrews one more time. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior 
to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than the name. Here, the author of Hebrews presents to us the gospel of Jesus Christ. And throughout the whole book, he spends time systematically going through all of the Old Covenant to explain how Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of everything, of all the covenants, of all the promises that God ever made to humanity and to his chosen people. And here in chapter 2, starting at verse 1, gives us a warning against neglecting the salvation that's found in Christ. The author says, Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, he's talking about the law being given to us through the angels, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. So instead of it being declared by the angels, like in the Mosaic law, the Lord himself declares the salvation that's found in Christ. And it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. We have to put our faith in Christ alone, not in our works, because we can't be saved by the law that condemns us, but we can be saved by the person and the work of Jesus Christ. His righteous life for those 33 years and his sacrificial atoning death on the cross. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a great salvation. We thank you for your grace and your mercy shown by this and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You sent the sacrifice. You slaughtered that sacrifice and you offered the blood to yourself to make atonement for the sins of the world. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We praise you through Christ in his name. Amen. If you want prayer, if you have any questions regarding the message of the Bible as a whole, Christianity, um, now's your time. Come forth and I'll pray with you, minister to you, minister to you personally. Um, other than that, you are dismissed from church, but not from the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Wasn't that a good message?